Hey you guys, welcome back to my channel. If you are new, my name is Addie. I am a full-time working mom with two little girls. One is just nearly three and the other is about to turn six months. With coronavirus, I am now a full-time work from home mom, which has had its challenges, but we have been doing really well. When I had Juliana, I was thrown into staying at home with a newborn and a toddler and I really struggled for the first two weeks. It was so hard. I was home by myself with a toddler, with a newborn. My toddler didn't understand why I didn't have time for her. My newborn needed me all the time. There were so many days where there was just so much crying between all three of us. What I ended up doing was making a schedule and that literally saved my sanity. I would not be here today, I don't think, with two kids intact if I had not made that schedule. I no longer had to come up with something off the top of my head to like entertain my toddler with and I no longer had to think about what was coming next. I just already knew. It just relieved so much stress and life got so much easier. So now with coronavirus and everyone being quarantined, my work has been mandate work from home for a little while now. We have been in a transition period yet again. And guess what? My schedule came right back out and it has been working great. The transition has been much easier than I thought it was gonna be. My toddler loves activities that we get to do every day and I've been able to get work done. My husband has been able to get work done. My kids are happy and playing. They love having both mom and dad home. Yes, there have been times where it's been hard, but for the most part, it's been really good. We've enjoyed our time together. We've all been able to get our work done and we are thankful for the schedule. So here's what our schedule looks like and you can tailor this to your situation, but at least it will give you a couple ideas on how to do your schedule and what kind of things you can put in your schedule. So first thing that's on the schedule is waking up. We wake up a couple of different times in my family. My older daughter wakes up around 7, my newborn wakes up around 7.30. Usually my husband is up early like 6 a.m. so he's already downstairs and is there to greet Isabel when she comes down in the morning. And I usually wake up with the baby whenever she wakes up around 7.30 typically. So around 7 when she, Isabel comes down, she's usually doing whatever she wants. She'll be maybe playing with a doll or coloring. She gets 30 minutes of screen time a day. So sometimes, usually I'd say, she picks that time in the morning when she first wakes up to kind of just snuggle with dad on the couch and watch her screen time. Sometimes she'll just do 10 minutes. Sometimes she'll do the whole 30. But... It just depends on, we kind of let her just do whatever she wants as she wakes up. Then at 7.30 when I come down, I immediately kind of give her a hug and then go into breakfast mode and we all sort of help make breakfast. We will eat together in the kitchen, we talk, we tell jokes, we just kind of have a little bit of family time before the day kind of really takes off. As we finish breakfast, she'll kind of just play around. If she doesn't take as long as we do, we like to eat our breakfast and have a hot cup of coffee and she'll kind of just hang out or play to herself while we're doing that if she's already finished. And we end breakfast time by bringing our plates to the sink. And that is what triggers chore time. So usually breakfast starts at 7.30, ends around 8. 8 to 8.30, we will do chore time. And chore time for us is kind of just like a morning reset from the night before. So for example, it might be Isabel picking up the books from her room for the stories that we read last night because somehow every night she manages to throw like 15 books on the floor. So we might go pick up her books from the night before. We might make sure her clothes are thrown down the laundry. We might just do a quick pickup of any toys that weren't picked up the night before. If we have a family project that we're trying to get done, like putting away Christmas decorations or bringing down Easter decorations or cleaning up folding laundry or do, you know something of that sort, we'll try to fit that into chore time as well. Another thing that we add into chore time, which isn't really a chore, is getting dressed. Because if we put it off and we don't get dressed, there's a chance we might not get dressed for the whole day. So we make sure that like by 8.30, we are done with our chores, we are dressed, and we are ready to go for the day. At 8.30, when that happens, we go into free play. That is a really crucial part of the day because it sets our, our bond with our kids. 
So at 8.30, we are playing, we are tuned in, we are playing no phones, no computer with whatever they want to play. A lot of times for my oldest, it is playing doctor or playing babies. That's what she's really into, that's what she wants to play, and we just put our stuff away and we play because if we can get that initial 30 minutes of play in with them, they are much more likely to kind of occupy themselves and play themselves and give us time to do our work later throughout the day. At around nine o'clock, we will go upstairs into our classroom and have school time for at least a half hour. We like to do it as long as she'll stay interested, but sometimes it's only 30 minutes. We don't really plan anything the night before. We have a little dinosaur theme book that is a old homeschool of my mother-in-law's that she gave us, and it kind of just gives you a couple ideas in there. We'll also just use Google or Classroom Magazine, and ABC Jesus is another free resource for homeschool curriculum. So we will just use one of those sources and just come up with a lesson for the day. We usually only try to focus on one subject, whether it's math or science or letter recognition or something like that, but we just try to do that for as long as she will stay occupied. Now, it depends on what we have going on that day, how busy work is and meetings and that sort of things. Sometimes we can actually lead her through school. Other times we just kind of have to set up an activity for her, a learning activity, and let her do it herself while we work. And other times it's we can't, don't have time to do anything and we kind of just put on maybe a magic school bus learning or a, another learning film or a learning game or something of that sort for her to learn that way. Just depends on kind of our day. As soon as she's no longer occupied, we will move on to the next thing, which is always a sensory activity. We really like rice bin, sensory bins. We like water transfer, dot work, shaving cream, magnet tiles. We love all those little sensory activities and she will stay occupied with those for 30 minutes or longer, depending on the activity of the day. And what we can do is just kind of set it up for her, explain how it works, and then we can go back to work. And she will just kind of stay occupied by that for quite a while. So sensory bins are excellent sources of keeping them occupied. Around 10, we will get into movement. I wanna get them up, get some energy out, get them moving. A lot of times, if it's nice outside, we'll go outside. She can kick a ball or play on her playground or do whatever she wants. If we're inside, we'll maybe turn on exercise, which she really likes, or have a dance party, or just run around in circles around the house, whatever it is she wants to do, but we just like to keep the body moving, get some of her energy out for the day, and she really, really enjoys that time. So we usually do that from about 10 to 10.30. Later, if the other activities ran over, but you, you get what I'm saying. From 10 to 10.30 is usually when we have that scheduled. Whenever movement ends, from about 10.30 to 11, we will go into art. We like her to be able to do one creative art thing a day, more if she chooses, but we try to do art. So that could be stickers, it could be coloring, it could be painting, it could be playing with markers, whatever it might be, that is what she chooses. And again, art is one of those activities that I can kind of set it up for her and then let her do it. So I'm really able to kind of get things done while she does art, which is great. And if it's a nice day, sometimes we'll even bring that sensory activity outside to do, just to get some more outside time in for that day. For example, I'll show you right now as I film this, Isabel is doing a water transfer activity. And if it would have been nice outside, we would have probably brought it outside and drawn a building with chalk that looked like it was on fire and had her transfer the water from the sponge from a bucket to that building to put out the fire. So little things like that help keep them entertained and moving spaces and just keep things less breakdown. <laughs> So then from 11 to 12, we have free play or open-ended play. And we do that for the last hour because a lot of times those other scheduled activities will run over. She'll stay interested in something for a little longer than we had planned. So it's nice to have this hour of wiggle room to you know, allow her to play with things as long as she wants because 11 to 12 is kind of the hardest to keep them entertained because it's not a structured activity. It's just open-ended play, and that's often when they would want mom or dad the most. 
So we try to have all the other activities before then so that if they run over, this time is extremely shortened. And usually it is. Usually we end up just having only 15 minutes of open-ended play because all the other activities ran over. But even if it's an odd day where we have the whole hour, we still have so many resources at home to be able to allow her to use that open-ended play. So things like Legos, magnetiles, kinetic sand, pretend food for her to play restaurant, Play-Doh, cars, trains, you know, we have so many different things for her to be able to play with. And that doesn't even include all her stuffed animals and baby dolls and doctor supplies that she likes to do most of the time anyway. So that open-ended play is really just toys that they can make believe and imagine with and that keep them a little more occupied than toys with flashing lights. And so oftentimes I will sit in the same room when she plays with them because otherwise she comes looking for me. So it's just easier if I'm there then she's more often able to play by herself alone. And the little one, by the way, the baby, she, if Isabel is around, she is pretty occupied. She loves watching her big sister and I usually just give her a couple of her own toys so that they don't end up fighting. But usually if her sister is around, she is totally fine to play kind of to herself as well. But anyway, and sometimes during independent play, she will come up to me with her doll or her Ariel and say, oh, hey, I'm Ariel, will you play with me? And I'll take the Ariel doll and say, oh, hi, Ariel, can I go to the doctor? And, you know, play with her for just 30 seconds or something. And then say, you know, mommy has to keep working, but as soon as I'm finished, I'm really excited to play with you. And she's really good about, you know, going back and playing and letting me get things done. So after independent play, we kind of move to lunch. And it's a great transition period because she can keep playing if she's really into something while I prepare lunch. And then she can also come make lunch with me if she wants to, if she's finished playing. So usually I'll say, okay, I have to go make lunch. Do you want to keep playing or do you want to come with me? Usually she'll say she wants to keep playing. Otherwise she does sometimes come and cook with me, especially if we're doing hard boiled eggs or something, an egg salad where she gets to cut the egg. She really enjoys doing that. So then when I'm almost done preparing lunch, I'll tell her, okay, five minutes left to play. And so then when lunch is ready and at the table, I tell her, all right, come on. And it just avoids the tantrum because I've been able to give her a warning. So that's why independent play is actually a really good transition into lunch. So then we'll eat lunch and hang out. Okay, so after lunch around 1230, we will then head up for nap. And about a half hour of that is for nap time routine, which usually starts with me putting Juliana to sleep first because that's usually her nap time. She's still taking three naps a day. So we'll put her to sleep and then Isabel and I will go to her room and we'll usually read two books and then I will give her her doll or stuffed animal, whichever she wants that night, that day. And then she will usually kind of hold that, talk to it, play with it, roll around a little bit before she eventually falls asleep, but that's fine by me. She'll usually nap for two hours from one to three but there are days where she's just fighting it and she does not want to nap. And you know what? That's okay. I have told her, you know, if you just want to sit quietly in your room, read a book, play with your doll for two hours, that's fine. So she'll do that some days instead, but nine out of 10 times she will actually nap. Even if she doesn't want to nap and she complains, eventually she usually does fall asleep. Now, Juliana, she only naps for about 40 minutes. So if I put her to bed around 1230, She's usually up by 1.10, so like right when I walk out of the room with Isabel, 10 minutes-ish later, Juliana is waking up. So unfortunately, that doesn't leave me a lot of alone time to get work done. And that's actually the hardest time with Juliana because if she sees me, she wants me. And if there's nothing else or no one else to occupy her, that's when it gets tough. So I usually have to sit either right next to her and let her be in the bumbo seat with like a couple toys or spoons of things she can chew or nibble on or I'll put her right next to me in her high chair and give her a couple of foods to munch on. She just turned six months so we've just started baby led weaning so that's usually something she likes to do now too. And if I want her to play, if she's not doing either of those things, then I have to go in the family room, put her with her toys and then leave the room altogether. Now I just go to our dining room where I have direct line of sight into our family room and can see what she's doing so I can make sure she's safe. 
but if I'm in the room with her, she will just try to crawl over and get me and want me. So I have to physically leave the room so that she can't see me in order to get her to play alone for, you know, 20, 30 minutes or something like that. So that's usually what I do with her while Isabel is napping, but I usually am able to get a decent amount of work done during that time. Around three when Isabel wakes up, usually she kind of just struggles to wake up a little bit, comes downstairs, I give her a hug, and then we try to get dressed and go outside as soon as possible to get more fresh air activity outside time in for the day because she, she loves being outside, even if it's a struggle to get her outside after nap sometimes. But um, once we're out there, I usually bring a blanket and some toys for Juliana to hang out in, or I put her in the swing. Isabel just runs around and does whatever she wants. She'll play on the playground, she'll ride her scooter, she'll just move sticks, pick up dirt, whatever it is. I don't care. She can do whatever she wants. I'm usually on the blanket working while Juliana plays kind of nearish me. And usually outside there's so much to distract her that she isn't just crawling for me the whole time. So usually that works out pretty well. If we run into it where like they're both antsy, I can't get anything done, then I will just take a break and we will all go on a walk, whether it's in the double stroller or whether Isabel wants to scooter while I walk Juliana, whatever it is, we will just kind of get out, go down the street and get a mental break before coming back. After about an hour of playtime, so around four o'clock, we will head back inside. Isabel usually wants a little snack at that time. So we'll just kind of sit down, have a half hour of like downtime get Isabel a snack, we'll probably just talk, think about what dinner is gonna be, that sort of thing, just kind of hang out for a half hour and kind of regroup. And then from 4.30 to 5.30, it's independent play. That's like where I bust out any work that I need to get done that I haven't finished. It's where I start dinner. It's where Isabel plays with whatever she wants without mom or dad. So she knows that that's her time. Sometimes if she has leftover screen time from earlier in the morning, if she didn't use it all, she'll use it during the independent play time. And that's fine, she gets 30 minutes a day, so it's whatever she wants, but that's independent play time. So if I'm making dinner, then she's allowed to come help me. That's a part of it, that's okay for independent play if she wants to help me cook. And she does like to do that, she does that pretty often. But as long as I'm still able to do what I'm trying to do, she's allowed to help. At around 5.30, we try to have dinner. That's because the earlier dinner for us, the better just to make sure the night runs smoothly. So around six-ish, dinner is usually over. We do clean up and family time and then kind of get ready for bed. So we'll clean up our dinner, then we'll have some family time if there's time. Juliana is still tired probably by 6.30 rather than seven because she is not quite needing three naps, but not quite needing four naps. So she's somewhere in between, so we just put her to bed a little earlier. So I usually tend to go up around 6.30 with Juliana to get her ready for bed and put her to bed. Isabel has a little bit more time with dad, and if she is taking a bath that day, if it's a bath night, then she'll go up a little bit earlier to take bath. So usually it's just family time, playing, and then she'll go up for bedtime around seven. We usually do two books and then she has to brush her teeth and go to the bathroom and then she'll get a story and maybe just chat with dad and you know do whatever they do at bedtime but um, and PJs happen before books so it's PJs books teeth bathroom story bed just has worked out for us easiest that way. She throws a tantrum if she doesn't get some of those things before going to the bathroom and brushing her teeth. So this is just what works for us. Maybe it'll help someone else out there too, avoid some meltdowns. But after that, she is in bed on her own at about 7.30 or so. It is getting lighter later now, so it's harder to like try and force her to bed earlier. But if she's in her room and just singing to herself or talking to herself, that's fine by us. She will fall asleep whenever she needs to fall asleep and wake up the next morning and do it again. So that is our daily schedule, pretty much from seven to seven of what we do every day and how we're still managing to get things done. I will note that for work, I typically make a to-do list the night before of everything I have to get done. And then I cross them off throughout the day. That way, if I need to take a break to take them on the walk, for example, I still have my to-do list, and as long as I get those things done every day, 
I might have to work a little bit later. I might have to wake up early the next day to make sure it's done, but I know that I'm at least getting everything I need to get done, done even if it's not between the hours of eight and five. It might be between the hours of seven and seven or seven and 10 p.m., you know, whatever it is. But as long as I have my to-do list done, I know I've gotten my work for the day done. And then the other thing I'll note is I am lucky that I have my husband home as well. He is also working from home at the moment. So unfortunately, if we're both home, my kids still prefer me, so I still have them most of the time. But if there is an instance where I really have to crack down and do something, or I need an uninterrupted phone call, or you know something of that nature, I do have him to lean on, which is really nice. So if you are in that situation as well, make sure you lean on your spouse. All right, so that's my schedule. That's all I have. I have this schedule written down with a printable and with some ideas on my website. I will link it I will link it below in the description box. And I also plan to do a more in-depth video on some of the activities that we do to give you more ideas for sensory bins and art time and that sort of thing um, very soon. So keep an eye out for that. We'll see you next time. Don't forget to subscribe.